I don't know why, but m my Weird Things notes folder keeps getting put in the recycle bin? Not me. <laughs> where, where do you, well, actually, hold on. If I s keeps, I think the last time I did it would have been like four months ago. Because I opened it and there was a bunch of notes that weren't relevant. So I was like, oh, this must be done. And well, I mean, so, like, it's it's my show notes. It's in the Weird Things folder. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I, this folder I, keeps getting deleted for some reason. Oh, that's really weird. Okay, then that's that's definitely not me. I thought you meant, because sometimes I see scratch pads on the desktop. Oh, yeah. Tell no. that they had time codes and so on. No, this is like the important show notes. Hi, everybody. Oh, now would be a good time to tweet. That's what I just did. Oh, we don't have a delete confirmation setting on this. What, it, what does when, that mean? When you hit delete, it just deletes it, and it doesn't ask you if you want to put it in the recycle bin. Oh. I mean, it doesn't formally delete it, but it doesn't ask you at all. I, I don't know how that setting would have come to have been. Yeah. Oh, how did this come to pass, sir? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh, hello. Are you guys enjoying this Sonic the Hedgehog music? Is that what this is? Yes. Yeah. It's awesome. That was my, in a in a pre-internet age, before you could just reach out to amazing independent creators and, and talk to them about, like, hey, what would it take for me to be allowed to use your music in my magic show? Yeah. Like, it used to be, like, you wanted to find music that was good but not recognizable. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and uh, for me, like video games, that was my secret. That was my secret stash. Nobody thought to look there. Yeah, too bad video game music never cut on. The whole yeah, right. Just sort of, <laughs> you know, died on the vine. Well, especially because you know that. Well, how much can you do with eight-bit sounds? <laughs> right. You only have eight bits. <laughs> yeah, you only got eight bits. Check out my Atari. The, remember the Atari computers? That was cool because like they could do like the bigger, more complex sounds and stuff. Oh yeah, dude. I remember, and they uh, also had the bigger color palettes. Yeah, uh, Bryce or Brian, you guys ever read the book Console Wars? I don't think I have. Um, Highly oh. recommend that. I've heard and, a lot uh, about it. The two of the best books on that, and that gets into the whole Sega Nintendo War. And do you know where Sega got its name? No. Um, uh, yeah, no, I don't. Is it, I mean, my guess is that it would be an, uh, a shortening of two words, which is kind of something that the Japanese companies do a lot. Like Nintendo is ready for me to blow your mind. Sure. Ready. Wait, wait, it's ages backwards. <laughs> nope. Okay. Ready? This is this is a thing that kind of gets forgotten. Can, can, can I real quick? Uh, uh, the only thing I know about Sega, the first time I ever saw it was Sega had a game called Tax Scan for the Atari Tax? 2600. T-A-C-S-C-A-N. Okay. Uh, and it was um, you you use the paddles on it, and you could swing ships in a in a fleet squadron side to side as it went forward. Uh, and 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 it came with a poster that just said Sega, <laughs> like it said Tax Scan Sega. It was it was the the uh, cover art with the word Sega on there. And I was like, why is Sega so big on there? And then they went on to be Sega. So like a lot of video game companies or some of them, Sega started off as in the amusement and, con you know, arcade pinball type stuff, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sega was originally an American company. Okay. Sega was after World War II or during World War II, Pearl Harbor, what happened was they had, we used to have all these pinball machines in the officer's mess in our bases around the world. World War II starts and they're like, nope, get those pinball machines, slot machines, all that stuff out of there. So they're warehoused, right? Put in warehouses. After the war, some businessmen find these warehouses filled with these pinball machines, all this sort of stuff. And now we're doing Japanese reconstruction. So they bring them and they're limited by what kind of stuff, businesses and stuff you could start in Japan. So they bring them over to Japan and start these sort of pinball arcade sort of you know businesses there just put them in all the businesses all around there. And that became this coin-op business, became very big, and it was sort of the start of the whole Japanese coin-op culture. So it was, stands for Service Games of America. Wow. wow. But then it wow. became like a fully Japanese company, and Sega sounds like it's this Japanese thing, mm -hmm. but it started as that. That's amazing. That's remarkable. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and it's, so the couple really good books – Console Wars, which is really good, which has actually been a uh, every now and then it's been talked about like 
being made into a movie or a TV um, show, something like a uh, Halt and Catch Fire. I mean, no, it'd be like a movie because it's just very much like a there. The, the there was a very good period of t- time because it, it reads kind of like a Moneyball kind of thing or something like that. Console Wars is good, and then there's another one which is I think it's like the complete history of video games. It's been one of my picks before, which it just I thought was just a really really. Uh, great overview of the industry. That is awesome. So, like, I'm like the nerdiest of nerds. I'd rather just read about it than play the games. Uh, yeah, you know what? There, there's some kind of detachment that affects me as well. We've talked before about how much more I would rather listen to Dan Harmon or Kevin Smith talk about their works than actually watch their works, which is really well. Weird. That may say something else. That's uh, well, <laughs> shit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that was a real fascinating time of, of video games as well, just because it was all out warfare between all of these different companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, uh, there, you know, there's a good YouTube series called Fact Hunt, I believe. Uh, and the dude talks a lot about retro games and he does some listicle sort of stuff. But um, like the open faced buying reviews and magazine coverage and all the dirty deals and uh, all of the. Op- very open feuds between developers and uh, and 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 publishers and stuff. It, it, there, one of the fascinating stories was, you know, Atari's biggest competitor uh, in the day in the, on the in the arcade was I think Keys or whatever because they had Centipede and they had these other ones and that was the rivalry was between those two and people would go up to Noel and Bush and they're like, oh, those jerks, whatever. What nobody knew and even didn't really wasn't realized until much later was that. The head of Keys, if you looked it up, was Nolan Bushnell's neighbor. He actually created the company because in order to compete in certain markets, you had to have competition or they wouldn't let you sell your games. Into oh, like... wow. So he created this and it ended up becoming like it ended up they folded it back into Atari at some point. Whatever. It was a big rival, but it was just this. It was just secret. It was just secret. Nobody knew that it's actually Nolan Bushnell. <laughs> oh, know? that's hilarious. The second company. That's, great. that's amazing. Uh, I think I'm ready to go if you are, Andrew. Ready. I'm ready. ready to roll. I'm going to work it out. Work it out. Make it happen. Work it out. Work it out. Uh, all right. Take it away, Andrew, in three, two, one. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by dancing Justin Robert Young. That's me. I'm dancing uh, uh, all day and all night. Woo! And uh, kind of wallflower grooving Brian Brushwood. Geez, if I go step out in the floor, they're going to look at me. <laughs> yeah, man. I certainly hope they don't ask me to appear on a reality dance competition show someday. Oh, geez. Uh, 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 Brian, Brian is the, uh, the, the, the Katy Perry to my Migos uh, <laughs> reference. Uh, also, Brian, I didn't realize this until you said it, but this Friday or next Friday, I will be dancing for, for charity on a, a Twitch stream. Hashtag Twitch Unity, I think. They're doing a Let's Dance Marathon Whoa. on the page of Twitch. So I'm going to head oh, on so, over to So San you're Francisco. playing a video game, though, then. That's uh, all right. Game. All yeah. right. That's all right. Still legit. Still legit. You, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. It doesn't measure up, right? I'm no, 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 no. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like, uh, like no, it's fine. Big shot doing a show. No, it's a no, no, no. Show. It's fine. I get it. All right. You know, nowhere near. Well, because uh, I immediately thought, like, man, what dances would I know? Is it a contest to see how long you could go? And then you said, like, dance. I'm like, oh, those games are fun. You're gonna have a really good time. Uh, the you you learn names for dances and stuff. Uh, no, I think it's gonna be great. I think it's gonna be super fun. Um, gentlemen, you know what also is fun? And by fun, I mean possibly terrifying, and this could be the end of civilization as we know it, the proof that lasts that we're, we are not alone, and that not only that, that uh, um, you know, they're much more powerful than us and they could wipe us out at any moment. Can, can we talk about your definition of fun? Because <laughs> yeah. that's not what I learned. Yeah, I'm with Brian on this one. This doesn't seem fun at all. Listen, however I can wake, work, make the segue work is how it works. <laughs> so... Uh, We've talked about this before, and that is uh, there is a star informally known as uh, called a tabby star in the actual star. It's KIC 846, my credit card number. Um, And what was peculiar about this star was the uh, uh, was discovered by uh, Tabitha 
Voyagian, I believe that's her name. I think, and she's an astronomer at Louisiana State University, and uh, believe she was the first one to discover it. And they, and she wasn't one. This is all called Tabby Star. They just nicknamed it for her, which is cool. And the story behind the star was: remember, it's the one that they call the alien megastructure star. Which, by the way, it, that's, that's catchy. That's catchy. That's it that's, that's going to test well with the Utes. Phenomenon. This star is the one that they looked at, and it starts to fluctuate in very strange ways, in ways in which we've not observed before. And to understand why this stands out is that I don't know if you've ever gone outside at night and looked up, but there are a lot of stars. And mm. this is a fact. Hey, by the way, this is the exclusive insights you're only going to get here on Weird Things, people. We're not afraid to tell the real truth. And also right, a, a lot suspicious of- Suspicious number of stars. I mean, yeah. come on. And, and we've, we've aimed telescopes at a lot of these stars, right? And we're like, hey, interesting. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay, next one. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. What we've never seen before is this variable fluctuation like we're seeing from Tabby Star, which astronomers and scientists, you know, doing their crazy thing, trying to come up with explanations have been like, huh, what would cause this? And we don't have any ready examples of what we think it's most likely to be. We just have some theories. The most, the most uh, non-crazy theory is that maybe it's a swarm of comets that goes in front of the star periodically and causes this occlusion. But a further out theory, and this was proposed by scientists, said, hey, listen, I'm not saying this is what it is. But if we're going to consider all possibilities and the fact that the universe is a very big place... I don't want to have to be the one, only one saying that, you know, alien megastructure is a possibility. And so there was a paper written out there that said, hey, listen, uh, could, you know, that's a thing that we need to think about the possibility. And it was, I think, mostly, I mean, outside of, you know, academia where I'm aware of, it was accepted pretty well. It's like, yeah, no, we, we can't rule out that possibility. And and because it was a very, you know, it was a phrase like, hey, I'm just saying, you know, I'm not saying it's what it is. I'm just saying that we need to think about this. So that's one of the possibilities that was floated around. That's why I got the nickname, sort of the alien megastructure star, because if you were building a massive Dyson sphere or ring or something around there, it would have to be stable, it might resemble the process of building. It might look something like what we're seeing right now. So the problem is, is that we haven't had a lot of good observation of the star when it's in its fluctuating period, because by the time it's flux goes through a little fluctuation, then a big fluctuation, then everybody's like, oh, what's going on? They go, look, yeah, it looks sort of normal. Yeah, we know it fluctuated, but we haven't aimed telescopes at it that can pick up, let's say, chemical signatures, because if there's a bunch of comets orbiting, we can look at a spectra and we can see, oh, there's little bits of dips or, you know, variances here, which tells us that it might be, you know, some where the chemical composition is. And so we've been like, well, that's great, but unfortunately, it's never doing it. We want to look at it. But one of the things that got noticed was that it seems like there's a little little bit of a dip followed by a big dip. And we just had a little bit of a dip, and people think there might be a big dip that might be the time to aim the telescopes at Tabby Star. And we're going to have more telescopes aimed at it than ever before to see what's going to happen. This is the exciting stuff, is to watch the very human drama of scientists run, running out to social media saying, everybody, turn your telescopes right now. If you have... Uh, you know, if, if you have the, the bandwidth and the freedom to do so, please get it over there. Get all the data from as much as possible so that we can aggregate it. Um, uh, I think it's interesting because there is there's what are all the vectors that we can learn from here? We can learn from the rate of the dipping, how often it happens, if there's a regularity or a pattern that we can eventually figure out matches certain orbiting bodies uh, or expected you know structures of that. Um, uh, you also have uh, uh, the intensity, the the fact that it's a three. Is it we're at a three percent dip now, or that's the maximum is when it hits? That's 3%. where I think they measured it was at three percent. Yeah, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, and then on top of that. Uh, you know, the outside chance, if it is a cloud of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, comets or whatever, then uh, then then the spectar spectro 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 spectrophy spectro spect- spectrograph uh, get a spectrogram yeah, think- spectrography spectrography. Is that what it is? Spectroscopy, I think. Spectroscope. Right. That word. Um, uh, I mean, that can be huge. And especially because we talked about there are certain elements that. Uh, uh, that when you see them, they give pretty good clues. And uh, I don't know. Uh, it's it's fun to watch everybody, you know, uh, Avengers up to uh, witness something so unusual. So we we could 
we could get if we look if we aim and we're like, yeah, we're seeing some vapor and stuff. It's just comets, you know. Oh, cool. That's that's neat. It's a cool thing. But if we look at it, we're like, no, we're not seeing that. In fact, we're seeing like a strange carbon and a reflection sort of some sort of index or something there. I don't know. I'm not an expert in alien megastructure engineering, so I don't know specifically what would tell us that was the case. But we could end up with another mystery. Yeah, well, and and oh, okay. So uh, Andrew, obviously, you are not an expert on alien megastructure technology. But let's say you Sadly were no. an expert on alien megastructure technology. What would what would you sound like? Like what 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 would uh, what what would you say to this news? It would be a series of high frequency clicks and squeals. Ha! <laughs> Speaking of which, man. Uh, did you, uh, did you see that, uh, sea lion pull that little girl into the water? Yeah, it's, you know, it was a playful, let's hang out. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrifying. Yeah. Uh, so I'm saying is this, is that we're, we're in a period of time where we're trying to figure out what this is. And there might be some interesting things that we might notice there. There could be things that might suggest there's some sort of material manufacturing, whatever. I don't know what that would be. I just know that we get the data. But let's hypothesize for a moment. Let's say we aim the telescopes there. We don't see water, the evidence of that we think it's comets. We see something that looks like it's, you know, some incidence that, that looks like it's a structure that's giving off a certain amount of thermal energy that's absorbed from the star. I have no idea. But just say we say something that says like, wow, this is consistent with an alien megastructure. And last we checked, we're not in a Peter of Hamilton novel. So well, and and okay, so so in this scenario, uh, I would imagine that we let's let's say over ten years, they have enough telescopes with enough data with enough uh, spectros spectroscopy. There it is. I said it. Data. Uh, just data. Enough data. <laughs> spectro spectroscopic data that um uh that that basically like yeah, it's got to be a a, a a creature made something or other. But here's the thing. Anybody smart enough to know how to start building a Dyson sphere? Let's say it's a Dyson sphere or or some kind of corrective thing where it's like, hey, we get these solar flashes, we have to protect our planet, so we built these giant umbrellas or whatever. Um, the uh, the very act of building it means that you're very likely smart enough to realize that unlike anything else we can think of, nothing would more clearly telegraph the position of your cell uh, of your civilization than doing something like this. We have, is there any other way outside of, I mean, I, I, like, I don't know, I guess you could coordinate a series of causing suns to go supernova. That sounds insane. Um, I can I can think of nothing else. That's a bigger beacon to say, Hey, all other civilizations, this is us. This is us here, which maybe, maybe that's even the purpose of it. Maybe they, they're building a beacon or something. There are much cheaper, easier ways to do it than that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like you're you, you do line of sight laser projection scan all the different stars in the sky and you could you could you do that just, with today's buy a billboard you know they're well, just okay, on but, the side but of the road I, again i'm not saying by. i'm not saying it's an efficient way i'm saying it's the loudest way i could think of because none of the things you said think, would reach out to lesser advanced civilizations i well i don't i don't think it's I, I would I don't think that I mean I don't think it's a, I don't think it's inefficient or the loudest way to do it for the amount of energy it would take to do it it's it's hey you know like hey we want to we want to contact people in other planets well let's spell I, out I, I, lay, I, again, we're all gonna lay down on, what's I, that? I, I I think I think you're you're chasing a thread that I wasn't setting up uh, my my point was anyone who makes it has to know that this is a side effect of it is that you are making an extraordinarily loud beacon. Uh, well, I thought you just said that it was the purpose. My mistake. Um, if 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 the if the if the if the effort was yeah if you wanted to tell tell people hey we're here or whatever there are more effective easier efficient ways to do that absolutely right, we can do it conventional technologies but if you as a side effect yeah sure do they care or do they know that's, I mean that's, that's my thing too, that's is, my point is is that I would think twice let's say hey we'll get lots of energy this way but everyone everyone on in the galaxy will know. We are an intelligent civilization based right here. And what does it say? Like, to me, those are two different questions. One, do we want the energy? Sure. Do we want it knowing that that tactically, strategically, for every, every everything ever, we are announcing to the galaxy, we're pretty much taking out a press release to release to, to everyone. I can't talk today. Uh, yeah, but, and, and, and go for it. And what does it mean about their civilization if they choose to go forward with that being the case? Well, I think part of it would be who's to say that they don't, already believe that the entire galaxy knows of their civilization 
and and that you know like this is just yeah we're the bleep blorps we do bleep blorp things we built the bleep blorp shield around star deep top like everybody knows it we're in, we're in uh, contact with all of the galaxy we're the greatest civilization ever known and it's only us the galactic equivalent of the bushmen in the uh, uh you know uh, Brazilian rainforests that are like, whoa, what the hell's that bright light thing? Like, oh man, look at them. The, the, the deep dorps, they're crazy. <laughs> I, I, yes, and um, I, I think that too is you, I kind of like to sort of step back and say, okay, we, we, we all have the habit of, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, of like looking at things from sort of the, the Star Trek, you know, every alien's basically us, but with a funny, nose prosthetic kind of thing. And when you start thinking about really alien intelligence where it could look nothing, resemble very thing, very little like what we have for intelligence other than it's tool building, building the concept of other or whatever could be an alien idea to it. It could have just so many, you know, ants build ant mounds because, you know, they build ant mounds. That's what they do. And sure. like, well, like, that's where they are. We need to spray them. So, um, so like non-sentient, hive-minded space bugs who think only to expand or, or you know, to grow like bacterial or, cultures or whatever. You know, or us, you know, 600 years ago, fully sentient, but we're kind of thinking like, you know, we're we're kind of like the high point of everything in the universe. And like, well, you know, we, we've gone to other continents. We found people who look like us. Well, they're not really us. Let's be real, you know, and that there's a lot of a lot of things in between. But also it's like, yeah, we're going to build it. And other people know. And if 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 they if they had the technology to harm us, they would know we're here already. You know, your the amount of radio signals and things like that we we give off. That the fact that we're building the skyscraper. You know, if you couldn't figure out we were here by now, you're not a threat to us. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That seems like a pretty big logical fallacy for a civilization advanced enough to build and a Dyson sphere to overlook. Wait, what's the fallacy? Uh, that you haven't found us so far, therefore you're not a threat. Uh, I, I, well, that... I would say if they're capable of building Dyson spheres, and it took a Dyson sphere for us to realize they were there, I would. I don't think that's a fallacy. I okay, think so that, what about? Okay, this is interesting. So you're right. So if they're first, if they look around and there are no uh, Dyson spheres that they can detect, then they then then all that makes sense. But what about the second? Like, let's say we're watching. And we watch this thing slowly become totally Dyson sphered. It takes 100, 200 years, but but we've documented enough of it that that from the rhythm of the pulsations of the of the dimming and all that, we can actually detect the shape of the sphere. It inspires our scientists to figure out like, oh, I bet it's this kind of structure and all this stuff. And now we have to make the decision as a human society whether or not we want to engage in the 200 year process of attempting to build or 500 year, however long. Um, like, does does it change anything to be the second person in the game theory of it well yet we'd want to analyze sort of the reasons why they're building the dyson sphere and and i'm trying to remember or to look up right now to figure out uh what kind of star they're dealing with because like if, if you're using with like just like a little white dwarf then yeah you know you kind of want to build one of those things because you're not getting a lot of heat you know and we're our problem with building a Dyson sphere around our sun is that, you know, as stars as stars go, we're, we have a very it's going to be a very short lived period. You know, we're going to be, you know, a couple billion years to can expand and sort of dissolve, you know, where we are. So it is KICs and F type. So it's a it's a main sequence star. Um, uh, about one to four times that one to one point four times the mass of the sun. So it's not a white dwarf. So it's a pretty sizable uh, star. Um, I mean, comparatively, not a big one. I mean, it, it's we're like a yellow dwarf. So anyhow, point is, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess if we're like if we're you would build it because you're like, what's the advantage of it? And the advantage is tremendous amounts of energy. And in the only applications where I think where you start wanting to get that much amount of energy is extreme amounts of computation, which means, you know, Borg planet. Yeah, I guess I guess my thinking would be even if we were able to deduce the main swaths, uh, there's a difference between being the guys who invent that technology and the civilization that just, you know, looks at it like, oh, I get it. Uh, like if you're capable of inventing it, then 
you know, by all means, go ahead because, you know, you're obviously super advanced. But if you're the guys cheating on someone else's notebook, maybe you don't want to do it in a way that announces to the whole galaxy, look at us, we're the type of civilization that knows how to make a Dyson sphere. But maybe not through our own efforts and, and Everything power. is through the Brian lens. It is amazing. <laughs> so oh, how will they judge me? How will they judge me? <laughs> uh, well, no, but, but we need to save our civilization. Yeah, but if I use their their method to save wait, our civilization, keep in mind I'm in the same clubhouse. Call first, should I call first or not? I'm keep I, in mind I'm in the same clubhouse as, as Stephen Hawking, who says he hopes that we never encounter any kind of aliens because if we do, there's only one result, and it's going to be that they're going to destroy us. And uh, so it's like uh, like I don't know. Like to me, to me, it's a not in some uh, inconsequential decision to 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 view the tactics tactics of of something like that i don't I, you know i don't I, I i don't know that i automatically agree with that assessment although i mean i have my, my friends who do project or with like you know who were ones behind project Starshot. one of the projects they had was to send like a chip with our dna to another star system and i'm like i'm not for this idea i'm i'm not going to support this kickstarter um it that's <laughs> not a good thing to me but i i you know, we we still when we imagine these alien contact civilizations, many of them. I'm not saying for you. I'm not saying I don't know what's in your head, and I don't know what's in Stephen Hawking's head. But often people describe them, and it's like, you know, people who are just slightly more advanced than us, and it's it's us. You know, it's Europeans meeting the Indians. It's always that, and it's like, I'm kind of like, I think it's it's more like, you know, it it could be. Because we we never imagine them being more ethical than us. You know, we always imagine that that our on us on our best behavior, they're going to be no better than that, right? And and we think of the examples. What's it going to be like? Well, you know, what it'll be like us when the Europeans when there's a rapid you know expansion stage. Maybe I mean that that maybe or if they're that, it'll be way worse. It'll just be Borg and it'll they'll annihilate us, or they're going to be a heck of a lot more enlightened than we are. And they're already there and they already know we're here and like, yeah, you guys do your thing. So here's the good news is that if they are that enlightened, they'll realize that it's much more efficient. Like they'll they'll have invented Sid Meier's civilization by then and they'll realize how costly actually destroying a society and building it up is. And instead, they'll get a cultural victory by just like they'll send us better reality shows than we ever thought possible. And we're like, let us join your collective. Well, but, I, you know. I keep think because you try to look at examples of like we're on our best behavior when we when we're going through periods of abundance. When we have periods of abundance, then we're we're less likely to go take things from other people because we don't have to. You know, you look at the the periods of colonialism and expansion and whatnot. You were going through periods where you might have had extremely wealthy people in Europe, but you had a lot of poor people and a lot of us aspirational people who were willing to become conquistadors, etc. That's been because there weren't opportunities for them. If you were the son of a rich family but you had no money, ah, I'm going to go to America and enslave some people and you know build a fortune. That was a business plan. That was the startup, you know, for a couple hundred years. It was to do that. Yeah, ima imagine taking that one to ye old shark tank. <laughs> uh, Mark Cuban would be all for it. Um, so uh, my If I gave you 300 is, doubloons right now, would I, could I buy 10% of your slave trading luck? <laughs> <laughs> so my uh, – I guess I, I just got sidetracked there. You know, we, we – uh, imagine so periods of abundance were that so when, but right now we're in sort of this relative we're comparatively in a period of abundance and there are tribes there are still uncontacted tribes or minimally contacted tribes in certain places in some islands in indonesia and places in south america and stuff and the governments there even those governments say hey these from lesser developed countries like yeah no we want to protect them we'll, we'll try to do our best to protect them when things get tough here whatever we do intrude and we do that but and our best behavior, our best version of ourself is we want to protect them, which is a very new idea. You know, we weren't worrying that about that 200 years ago. Nobody was saying, how do we protect these people other than missionaries and stuff? So in our best version of ourself, we're trying to protect these uncontacted people, which I imagine a highly advanced civilization could be the best version of ourself, much better than we are now, would have that same mentality. I still wrestle with this right now. Are we acting ethically, though, right now when we have these little un uncontacted tribes, these people that they throw spears at helicopters and we check to make sure they get wiped away by the typhoon, you know? Yeah, that's a really – that's an uncomfortable question because it forces us to really look at ourselves. Um, it, it seems to me that regardless of whether – like on the one hand, yes, I understand that, that these isolated tribes are of unfathomable um, anthrop uh, anthropological – 
data value, right? I mean, it's like there's so much to learn about uh, about uh, prehistory and that kind of stuff uh, in theory. Um, but on the other hand, uh, that makes them less than sovereign human individuals who have the right to decide that they want to participate in Internet culture and get vaccines and so on. Um, yeah. But I, I mean, I, I, I think I think. <sighs> I, I, I think the only ethical move is to extend to them all the uh, benefits uh, and rights that come with being a, a citizen of planet Earth. As a, but, as a, but, but what is what is the limit to extension? Like if we if we're flying a helicopter by and we're like, we know that when we get off the helicopter, we want to tell them, hey, look, here's modern medicine and here's a, a, a teen vogue, uh, uh, all of the best uh, that the world has to offer. And and. You know, there a spear comes through your windshield. Uh, uh, did we do our best? Do we just like, well, all right, well, I guess it's an early lunch. Let's let's powder back. Man, that's a tough question, and it also depends where they are. Because if we found an isolated tribe of Native Americans, uh, you know, let's say up in a quiet pocket of the Appalachians or something, then um, uh, then I think America's uh, Americans would instantly think like, okay, do we bring them up to speed culturally? <laughs> like, do we bring them Lady Gaga and, and, and internet connection? Whereas, obviously, if they're uh, in, we'll say, extremely poor, extremely isolated parts of Africa, then uh, then is the standard of living, you know, the the local tribes, the connected tribes. I and these are. I, and these are not, I don't think they're easily answered questions. People keep bringing up the prime directive, you know, like in Star Trek. I'm like, I always thought that was an immoral policy. Yeah, I agree. It was agree. such an immoral idea. Because yeah. it's like, all right, hey, my neighbor's beating his wife. That's it's their thing. It's their thing. I'm not going to call the cops and be like, well, yours legally. I'm not, I don't act out of things because what I think I'm legally responsible to do. I act out of what I'm morally responsible to do. Well, then, but let's also, like, let's Although say... I do like say, the idea of a Star Trek episode where somebody is, you know, like a witness to a domestic dispute and the answer is like, nope, the rules say I should stand regally on board and then sit in my chair. Ba-na-na, na-na-na. They just take <laughs> off. Well, and, and, off. and I guess also there's... Uh, the, the part where the Prime Directive does make sense is uh, cultural practices that we don't understand from the outside might, you know... Uh, like, for example, let's say uh, let's say the enlightened folks time traveled from Star Trek to modern day Earth and they're like, you still mutilate your genitals. What is this circumvention? We can't allow this to happen. You're cutting off pieces of, of people's genitals. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I, that's one of those like, where does the line stop shifting, I guess, would be the question. Oh, oh, agreed. I absolutely 100 percent agreed. And I think that I, I think about these uncontacted tribes and thinking like. Okay, um, the women are forced into marriage at 12 years old. The infant mortality rate is ridiculously high. Average age they live to be is like 40 or something. And now, granted, you know, like then they say, oh, you know, when helicopters come by, they throw spears and stuff because they want like, yeah, they're afraid of them, they're terrified of them. And 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 I agree, I understand why they do that. But also, it's like we're 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 taking the actions of the most, you know. It's like yeah, when every time we send government government workers by these uh, cult compounds in Utah. They throw rocks at them and tell them to go away. <laughs> it's yeah. like, ah, everything's fine here. Nobody's being victimized. Everybody's cool. You know, all the people here know what we're offering and have a full. They're making this choice, knowing fully cognizant of what the pros and cons are, which is not the so case. Is 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 the greatest cultural bargain on this Rumspringa? Like, I feel like that's that is like the greatest. Like, obviously, the the Amish have a a a, a restrictive society as to what they do and say, but there's the Rumspringa thing where they can. The kids go to New York and they all go to uh, foam parties and do crack and, you know, and then they decide whether or not they want to go back to Amish town or they want to stay out in society. Like, that seems to be like a fairly efficient cultural well, bargain that, for both well, sides. And, and that's that's uh, almost literally what happened with, uh, you know, with warring, uh, you know, all these different fiefdoms in, in Europe. You know, you would you would take I mean, You see it in Game of Thrones. You grab someone else's kid, grow them up in your family, give them put them in the complicated position of understanding both sides of the story and, you know, let that help shape things going forward. I I don't. I mean, that was more of a thing of the noble born and not a thing where the average sort of person did. And and, and, and and I think what was cool about what the Amish do and sort of like what the Mormons do is that your average everyday person in those cultures, they're like, yes, we're going to send you out there in that world and we're going to let you make this choice. Rather than shielding you from this choice all along, we're going to we're going to put you out there into the world to make that choice. Um, 
you know, which then is a you then at that's how it's one of the ways you reinforce the strength of it and you build ties. Of course, if you have a shrinking number of people in your culture, you stop doing that because you're like, well, we keep sending them away, so we can't do that anymore. But yeah, I love that. I think the answer is yes. That is the thing. So we should be working with these tribes to 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 do Amazon Rumspringa. Like they, they we 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 give them buses if they want that they can get up to Carnival. Well, I mean, the, the the problem, of course, is that when you take somebody from, let's say, an uncontacted tribe or whatever, and you have we have examples of people who are on these edge cases there, and they're going to be exploited. They're exploited for labor. They're exploited for sex. They're exploited for a lot of reasons. And so, we're not really good at integrating people in those civilizations. You know, the first generation ones, we're not so good at in integrating them. So, I think that's part of the reason why we don't. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're bad. Uh, maybe we should build a Dyson Spears. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we can sucker in some advanced uh, civilizations. Be like, yes, we're in the club. We're very smart. Oh, that's it. No, no, no. We just play possum. We're like, oh, we're so stupid. What are, where's the labor camps? And then we turn on them. <laughs> but I, I just like the idea of, like, you know, during World War II, you know, Japanese and German radio would broadcast their propaganda. We broadcast our propaganda. And then during the Cold War, we had Radio Free America. And, you know, and the beautiful thing about sort of propaganda is you can listen to it. You can be like, oh, yeah, no, uh, uh, this uh, Betty Berlin makes some very good points, you know, some very good points, you know. Um, and then your friends are like, you're being brainwashed. But then some of it you're like, oh, no, this is very effective. You know, BBC was a, was a very effective form of propaganda airing BBC around the world. Because it wasn't so much about like, hey, it's why we're awesome. It was more like, hey, here's news. Here's something useful. Here's something that's totally non-propaganda based or whatever. And you sort of could create a help one kind of still help reinforce sort of a world culture that way. Um, and there are obviously going to be subtle biases and stuff. But I, I like the idea of like, yeah, you know, if you want to like, uh, you know, we just we just park like a a floating movie theater offshore of one of these islands, you know, and like, you can come watch, you know, <laughs> we're going to give you free HBO for 30 days. Oh, uh, dude, you just start playing Game of Thrones just on a barge. <laughs> like, that's, 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 yeah, that might be the way to do it. I think that's, that's, that would be my way is like, hey, here's this information if you want it. We're not going to go to you. We're not going to force you to do anything like that. We're not going to knock on your door. But if you if you're, you you pick up the signal, just know it's it. there. Yep. And then we just listen to their conversations and find out what in their language it means to say, wait, I thought they were brother and sister. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell uh, speaking you what. Speaking of building Dyson spheres. We're not in any way propaganda. We just know that. A healthy family begins with a Weird Things Patreon family. Yes. yes. I, I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who said, uh, whatever you do, don't be caught dead without supporting Weird Things Patreon at patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, if you go to Weird Things Patreon, that is patreon.com slash weird things, you can pledge whatever you'd like to keep this show going. It happens every single week because of the people that kick in some cash to keep us going. Also, oh. you get some benefits, right, Bryce? That's right. You get early access to uh, After Things, our sister show. Uh, you also get uh, email notifications when episodes come out. Uh, and uh, uh, you get a master feed, so you even get uh, those early episodes on, our, on an RSS feed. Right on. Master feed. Master food. Uh, hey, we should also point out that uh, we're live, uh, mon usually Mondays what? in the afternoon. Uh, and you can tune in and hang out with the folks in the chat room at twitch.tv slash night attack is where we broadcast that's that. That's 2.30, so 2.30 Eastern. So I shouldn't be throwing these middle fingers left and right on the video? Oh, <laughs> Great. Yeah, for audio listeners, and we're nude. <laughs> that's accurate. But that's fine because uh, we're all super buff. So I want to, you know, a lot of this cosmic talk, alien civilizations, all that's pretty heady. So I just want to change the topic to something a little bit more, you know, down, down a little to little grounded. Earth. Yeah. Um, let's talk about dark matter. Oh, dear. Uh, we... That's not sensitive. I, I read a really cool article uh, by Lisa Randall, and it's at Nautilus, Nautilus Magazine, which is Nautil and then .us. 
It's a really cool online science journal. They have like a print version too, I believe, but it's an excellent, excellent science magazine. They have a lot of really cool thought provoking things. Lisa's a physicist. I've met Lisa. She's very cool, very smart, written a number of books on physics. Uh, one of her specialties is, is dark matter. And in this article, she makes a very interesting suggestion that I really hadn't heard put forth by a sober, intelligent individual before about dark matter. And that is that when we think about dark matter, we kind of sort of think about this sort of like idea that it's it's this particle, you know, that it's this sort of it's just this, you know, single sort of like we're looking for this sort of particle we're trying to do. Um, but we, there is another notion, we, and that is the idea that it could be like we call, we call our matter, we call it baryonic matter because it's got protons and neutrons and stuff. Um, instead of like being like super exotic, but you could have dark matter could be yes, sir. Uh, uh, j just real quick, I, I I don't think we've talked about. And there may be people who are not familiar with what dark matter is. Dark dark matter is is the currently you know, the the X factor ascribed to the reasons that um, that galaxies don't spin at the expected rate. Uh, they they move much much faster than you would expect for a spiral to do. Uh, and the only way to make it work is if you inject lots of matter that is not seen or mm -hmm. indicated on any telescopes. We don't know. We can't see it. We don't know it's there. But um, and, and which is why, because uh, the equations all work with our standard model of physics, as long as we just put more matter than we can actually see there. But but if I'm hearing you, if I'm following your, your thread correctly, you say, well, what if we adjust the model? What if it's a force instead of uh, a matter? No, it's not at all what I'm saying. OK, um, uh, what 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 I'm saying is going the other direction is that we sort of have this idea of like, oh, maybe it's it's just this singular sort of particle, this dark matter particle that's out there. What, what uh, Dr. Randall suggests is, um, what if it's not just one particle? What if it's a bunch of there's an entire class of dark matter particles just like we have? Why do we assume it's one particle? Why do why do we assume that it couldn't have the same level of complexity that we have that you could have dark matter atoms, dark matter molecules, dark matter life? Wow. What? So that's what she's putting forth is like, hey, yeah, no, we're just assuming that these particles are going together. Like, oh, what if it's like, what if it's just a different, entirely different category of matter that, you know, we weakly interact through gravity and we can't see anything else, but it could have its own. So, okay. So, um, uh, in in the elegant universe, Brian Greene, one of the things he talks about is the idea of, of one of the things that string theory posits is that there are different uh, membranes or brains, B R A N E S, um, and that maybe ours was correct. Uh, our universe was created when two brains collided, and that release of energy created the universe. Um, Actual new data, we may have an impact point too, where we think that could have happened too. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. One of the parts that he brings up is that uh, consistent from brain to brain would be gravity, and he says the the only way you could talk to someone on a different brain uh, would be to send gravity pulses and eventually, you know, I don't know, like a record basically send pulses of gravity back and forth. Um, that would actually play if, if dark matter was in some, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm reducing this to a point that will make any physicist uh, vomit. So I apologize, physicist. But that, that would kind of make sense if, if, if the evidence for dark matter, i.e. the unusual movements of the spiral galaxies or of galaxies in general, uh, man, that's that's fantastic. The idea that that there's all that just on the other side of a gravity curtain, basically. Yeah. The the problem is we so weakly interact because on one hand, you could think, man, you, we could have sort of like ghost clouds of planets that sort of follow our own planet or whatever. Or we fought. But it's like it's so weakly interacts trying to figure out, like, what would be the likelihood of on even a solar scale, one body having an effect on another body? I don't know. But it is a fascinating idea to think that. You know, in, in theory, these things, we could pass right through the stuff. But if we pass through, like, you know, a super dense version of that, you know, would we get earthquakes? What would happen? You know, black, are there dark matter black holes? You know, I mean, there's just these, it gets into this whole other way of thinking that you're like, man, like, that's just spooky. Like, right now, there could be, we could be passing through another dark matter. You, you know what it reminds me of is, uh, as so many brilliant ideas, uh, it was written in a short story by Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke, because you turned me on to that collection of short stories where it talks about basically one being talking to another being about how he thinks that there might be life up there in the shadow ghost world where oh, where yeah. everything ends. And then, of course, what he's talking about is, you know, these are deep creatures that live and thrive and survive in the mantle of the earth and they swim around it and they're super dense and everything and that they're they're confused by what seems like noise up in the surface of the planet.
Yeah, it's it's a wonderful. I love I love that story. And there's neat stories about the idea of like life on a neutron star. So to your point, Brian, about the whole the in-brain idea, uh, which sort of relates to that is when the scientists did their sort of the mapping of the space, they found a region of space about 1.8 billion light years across that's colder than the surroundings. And they thought maybe it's a trick of light because it was colder and it had less than 10,000 galaxies. A new study has introduced a possibility the cold spot cannot be explained as a void. It is not due to the line of side effects. Instead, researchers at Durham University believe it could be the first evidence of the multiverse. They believe a parallel universe could have smashed into ours, affecting in a way similar to a multiple vehicle, similar to a multiple vehicle pileup. Oh. That impact was so incredible, according to this research, that it pushed energy out of a huge region of space, resulting in the caps cold spot. Perhaps the most exciting explanation is the cold spot was caused by a collision between our universe and another bubble universe, believe it or not, said Professor Tom Shanks at the University of Durham, uh, Durney, Durney, uh, Durham University. Welcome to slurring things. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I don't want to make anybody upset. I don't want to get too controversial here on weird things. I know we try to walk that line and be sort of, hey, a common ground for everybody. But I'm going to say it, guys, and I'm sorry. I apologize what the repercussions are going to be. The universe is kind of weird. Whoa. Man, you don't you don't need to, to verse shame. The universe yeah. is going to be whatever it's going to be. Yeah. I'm just saying. You know, what's weird to you, man, is normal to somebody else. Yeah. We're, like the dark matter reality that lives under our nose. God, literally, you, none I of mean, the I other just, universes have to hear you say this. God, why? Why does it have to be me? I mean, think about this. It's like just it was random news items grabbed today, and we went from, uh, "Hey, yeah, there may be an alien mega structure on the star because we don't know what the f it's doing." To, oh, here's a really cool article about dark matter. Like, yeah, we may, we may be like duplexing with an entirely or one or more other entirely different dimensions next to us. We weakly interact with gravity and we may actually be able to contact now that we're building gravity wave detectors. Oh, and yeah, apparently we had a drive by with another universe and we can actually see the damage. And apparently that's a thing that can happen by the way, is that you can bump into other universes and all of a sudden there's an impact zone. It's pretty amazing. Sleep tight kids. <laughs> um, you know, there's only one solution to this. What's that? Drugs. We'll go oh, on. all right. Sure. Let's do it. Let's all I mean, do drugs together. <laughs> By drugs, I mean Journey Quest drugs. Oh. <laughs> oh! Well, uh, let's find out what happened last week. What happened Previously last week? On Journey Quest! I grabbed the knife. Oh. And then start stabbing my throat. Your friend's gonna die. Unless. Unless we, we what? have a version that lets you travel forward in time. No. For my friend Brian, <laughs> let's go to the unstable future where he's probably gonna die anyway. <laughs> so, uh, last we. You're such a chode, Dude. Brian. Jesus. Why'd you stab your neck? I, you... I killed Lennon. I killed both Lennons. All the Lennons are dead in this reality. Yeah, and also all the Bryans. Yeah, well, you did yeah. kill your actual real self, though. Hey, man, look. I mean, you know, some people, they're big talk about sacrificing themselves for the greater good. Only one guy has got the muscle and the gumption to make it happen. Also a knife. So thunderously stupid. I should not be going on this side quest to save him. <laughs> So the the side quest is that Justin has to travel forward in the future. Yeah. Right? To get the technology to try to heal Brian. Is my uh, what kind of condition am I in? Am I am I awake or am I with him? Am I is my ghost with him? No, you are Did they you download are my consciousness to condition. A... If you were in a hospital, you'd be in critical condition bleeding out. The hope is that I can literally go on this side quest and then come back in seconds but there's not like, like a bird a so i can heal you there's not like a bird companion that they've they've put my personality into to keep him company what? on this journey? like within five seconds see his shadow in the mirror and then run into a wall <laughs> at 90 miles an hour and break his bird neck 
uh, and immediately Sir find Matthew the doctor who's like, oh, here's here's the technology that'll heal your friend. Bird companion dive bombs to peck the doctor's <laughs> eyes out and then jumps into his mouth and dares him to chew. All right, look, if they can put my personality in a bird, they can take out my flaws, too. So maybe I won't be so scared, all right? <laughs> so, uh, 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 no, I, I think... Uh, I am guided by my love for Brian, which will be voiced by Brian as as I go on this side. <laughs> so, uh, Justin, flash forwards, we think, into the future. He's in some high-tech, futuristic office environment. And there's somebody sitting at the desk who's about to dramatically reveal and turn around. And, and I'm going to ask you a question first. Who do you think is sitting at that desk? Brian? First, it's just in, in, I'll let you, Justin. Yeah, well, can... I don't know. What, what would Brian, who, who would Brian think is behind that desk? Well, hold, hold on. Has he already teleported into the future? I'm in the future, and I'm sitting at a desk, for, uh, across the desk from a doctor who has his back, or her, back to me. And uh, uh, I hope that they're going to be able to give me the tech. I mean, but who I, do you think it is, voice It's going to be the architect from Matrix 2 Reloaded. Mm, interesting. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, uh, the guy who played Dumbledore. <laughs> Which Michael one? Um, the answer is no. Knowing see, knowing this reality, it's either Andrew or me or or somebody else that we know. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Um, you you see over the top of the chair, you see some white cottony hair. And the chair dramatically spins around. It's Morgan Freeman. Huh. <laughs> Who, voiced Morgan by Brian. Freeman. But who's Morgan Freeman and not Brian. He's not going to start stabbing himself in the neck. Oh, hello, Justin. I'm so glad to see you. I'm Morgan Freeman. Oh, my God, Morgan. Wait, it, it's literally like it's not. You're 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 actually well, I'm Morgan. Gonna, I'm gonna, Morgan Morgan's getting a text message right now. Hold on, I'm getting a text um, message right now. Me, uh, Morgan Freeman. Man, I got so many questions, up to and including. If uh, they're about my days on the electric company, those are a dark past, and we will not be discussing them. And then he taps his nose. Too much cocaine. I'm Morgan <laughs> Freeman. So he doesn't even he, like no subtlety for Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed not. I'm glad. Uh, by the way, have they offered you any pineapple juice? There's some pineapple juice. Uh, take a look behind you. Do you see it over there? Uh, I think to myself, what would Brian think about drinking that pineapple juice? Uh, the uh, like, uh, oh, Brian, Brian, Brian's just like uh, uh, I mean, uh Morgan Freeman says, uh, 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 quit thinking of that dead spirit. That's just a figment of your own imagination. Your Wait actual Brian is dying right now, and Wait. you're wasting and, and time. Freeman checks his text messages. Mm, yep. Oh, yeah, well, indeed. Uh, uh, Justin, here's the question. I've waited yeah. a long time for you to arrive here trying to save your loved ones. Your friendship with Brian is something known throughout all time and space in all realities. We're very fascinated by your journey, your quest. We have a word for it, but you wouldn't understand. But the important what? thing is what are you willing to do to, ta to bring your companion, Brian, back to life? Also, for the record, since I'm Morgan Freeman, I can make him slightly less dumb in the future. This is going to turn into something weird or gross. I I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just Morgan Freeman here I in my construct holding in front of you the opportunity to bring back to life your friend Brian Brushwood. All right. Let me just recap. So our friendship is famous. Throughout time and space. Very famous. We're big fans here everywhere. <laughs> here uh, and everywhere. <laughs> you said you had a name to... to uh, uh, no, some uh, people uh, call it the journey. Some call it the quest. There's a splinter faction that I'm a fan of. You know, we have another uh, okay. mashup. Um, what am I willing to do to save my, my buddy Brian's life? Now, I understand, I Justin. I... 
I understand that some people might have a difficult point isolating exactly where that line is, so let's start with something easy. Here's a bug, and he opens his hand, and then it's a little cockroach. And he goes, will you eat this bug? Okay, more, number one, I need to go ahead. Be, uh, before we get into this bug eating, I'm going to eat the bug, all right? I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to eat the bug. Okay. What's the tech that saves Brian's life? Uh, uh, well, that was a candy bug. <laughs> That's not actually the thing. And he, tur he turns back around, and, and you see some fidgeting about, right? And then when he comes back, he says... It's not racist that I'm reenacting this scene from Morpheus. And then he holds out his hands. <laughs> he goes, because I'm Morgan Freeman. And then in each hand is a red pill and a blue pill. And he says, one of these will bring your friend back to life. The other one, I rubbed on my genitals. <laughs> Please make your choice now. I want to uh, outright apologize to Brian Brushwood <laughs> that I ever doubted his uh, first instinct to murder any authority figure he came across because this is it un insufferable. Like, this is horrifying. Yeah, time Why is are you here, Morgan Freeman? What year is this? Uh, it's all times and always. Cheers is still on the air. Anything is possible. <sighs> And you won't tell me which one saves Brian and which one you rubbed on your balls. Oh, save that. Do you want to phone a friend? You have three lifelines. I grab both of the pills and I and I swallow them. I say, <laughs> oh, and, and then Morgan Freeman says, oh, uh, how fortuitous that you had both as both were rubbed on my genitals. <laughs> Somebody call that in the chat room. Also, <laughs> fighter Morgan Freeman. Also, both would have saved Brian, but you took them both. So a negative times a negative equals a positive, and he's dead again. So let's let's. Can can you draw a picture of a windmill? <sighs> okay. What weird Monty Python version of saving my friend is this? Like, like who like, do you are you the guardian of some kind of tech? I doubt that either of those pills were saving anybody. You literally just wanted to have somebody that you were uh, in charge of or had a superiority on eat something that was in your nether regions. Um, I'll draw whatever you want. I'll eat whatever weird ball pills you want to hand to me. I just need to know what's the solution that brings my friend back to life. The solution is you must say, bring my friend back to life and also give him awesome superpowers because I really want that for him. <laughs> That's the only price. <laughs> Brian, is this you? No, it's me, Morgan Freeman. I, we've isolated the one most challenging, morally bankrupt decision to make and in order to bring your friend back. And the viewers are enjoying this immensely. <laughs> so this isn't Brian in some weird alternate dimension. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, but you some know, people no, don't think if you're if, if I if I ask you if you're a cop, you got to tell me if you're a cop. Right? Look, some people don't think I'm actually Morgan Freeman because I don't mention it enough. That's a good point. I'm Morgan Freeman. <laughs> now, will you speak to me, Morgan Freeman, <laughs> that phrase to bring your friend back to life? I want Brian Brasher to be brought back to life, and I personally believe he not only should, but deserves to have superpowers that I will never have, that he can use, that are free from any influence of any third or any uh, uh, despots or dictators, unless, of course, Brian prefers to have Hitler in his ear at all times. In that case, he is more than welcome. All right. He says... Now it is time. Let the transformation begin. And he slaps his hands together and murmurs under his breath, I'm Morgan Freeman. And he, he claps his hands and he rubs them together faster and faster until finally it becomes blinding white light that, that is thrown all over the room. And when, as, as the, the brightness fades, um, you see Morgan Freeman grab his hair and just start pulling it straight up, and off, off pops the mask, revealing Brian from some other reality. I grab a knife, and I lunge at Brian. <laughs> <laughs>
And I, uh, 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 I, I, I say, <laughs> I say, oh, Justin, you don't know what you're doing. The purpose of this universe is to be the greatest actor ever. Come on, admit it. You thought I was Morgan Freeman, right? Yes, up to and including the point where I asked if it was you specifically. <laughs> I indeed always believed you were Morgan Freeman. See, all, <laughs> all right. Look, we got this all worked out. Uh, I'm glad that you, you you brought me back even though you didn't really but, need but, it. But wait. But wait. Uh-oh. You don't get it, Justin. You got it all wrong. <gasps> Read the text again, Brian. Oh. Uh. Oh, wait. Sorry. I'm so confused. Look, I, I just... You were convinced. deep into the role. You were deep into the role. That's how deep you were. I was deep in the role. Uh, the purpose of this universe is to be the best actor ever, which is why I successfully fooled you that I'm Brian. And then he pulls off the Brian face, and it's Morgan Freeman. He says, I have always portrayed Brian through all your friendship in all of time and space. Now that's it impressive. has always been me, Morgan Freeman. I don't know if that's the transitive property, but that's a very impressive <laughs> show for Mr. Freeman. <laughs> So what this means now is Brian is dead and Justin's new companion may be Morgan Freeman because the lights are starting to flicker. And he looks and he says, ah, the server bandwidth is getting out of control. The simulation's coming to an end. Oh, no, it's happening. Uh, look, we must go quickly. And Morgan Freeman um, uh, casts a magical spell and a portal opens to the side. And I said, no time to talk. We must go. I'm Morgan Freeman. I run after Morgan Freeman uh, uh, b before very briefly looking longingly at the knife that I had lunged at, at Brian's neck with and uh, <laughs> contemplating stabbing it into my own. You, 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 you enter the portal and you step into a Del Taco, but a run down Del Taco, very, very run broken windows. And you look out there and there's a post apocalyptic landscape and you see a little boy standing out there. As the wind blows the sand by and you see through the storm a boy waving at you and then he makes a sign with his hand that looks like a curse. And you remember back the people you let die in the bus. Mm. Wait, is the hand sign, does it look like this? Two fingers? Uh, no, it's the it, opposite. It's the curse version. Oh, the cursed, uh, the, the singularity. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, and you realize through. some of the first victims that you're that this is somehow you've been stepped into this totally not the dark tower type scenario now totally not the dark tower yeah i uh, prefer to call it the black canyon <laughs> black uh listen justin uh me morgan freeman here by your side as always can you just do the brian voice uh oh sure sure no we could do that uh hey listen um i mean i think we should seek out i've, I've had a vision it was like a whisper in my ear about the Dark Canyon, which I assume is a non-copyright infringing uh, nexus through which all realities converge. Actually, I, yeah, it, it, it's the Black Canyon. Black Canyon, Black Canyon. Black Canyon, Black Canyon. Yeah, Black thank Canyon. you, thank you. Uh, uh, good call. Uh, hey, um, I'm seeing a lot of weird stuff, and already I'm, I'm kind of. Uh, did Did I tell you I was Morgan Freeman? Man, it's like I can barely remember that now. Like, mm, but you do have vivid memories of hot, steamy sex with Jessica Sandy, and you're just not going to tell Jessica Tandy. You're not going to tell him about that, though. <laughs> Jessica Sandy and Jessica, Jessica Tandy. Tandy. <laughs> <laughs> it was trice foldishly. Um, it was a Tandy Tandy treat. <laughs> so, uh, look, I, I, I mean, I, last time I checked, they didn't install Taco Bells in the desert with uh, kids cursing us from our previous adventures. I'm going to say, kind of, all bets are off, and we're in a mysterious sideways extra extra earth uh, dimension here uh, uh sure man you're the one who's from this extra crazy world and you're morgan freeman and apparently i've always been best friends with morgan freeman and now we're like i can't go back to save who i thought was my dying friend uh or can i still man i don't even know what you're talking about i don't remember any of this we were we walked over that ridge and we saw this Taco Bell and then that kid cursed us. Del Taco. Del Taco. Del Taco. See, I even I misremember. I, I, look, let's just keep walking. Let's keep walking west. Let's go. Wait a minute. Okay. Now it's hey. hard to see because there's a windstorm, a sandstorm going on. Oh, we better and now get in you this, start to this Del Taco. 
very thunderous, loud sounds. Doom, doom, doom behind you. And you turn uh, around. Behind me. What do I see? You, you put your hands to your eyes to shield it from the grape flying into them. You see a dark shape. And next time on Journey Quest. Oh! <laughs> My God. Seems perfectly legit to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many episodes into Journey Quest are we? Not enough. I think we're. I think we just got past the prologue. I think we, yeah. we're really starting yeah. to dive down into the meat of it. Yeah. Uh, listen, gentlemen, it's time to do picks. Anybody got any picks? Anybody want to pick anything? Any uh, yeah, dude. Pick? I just finished the book Nudge, which was featured on uh, Freakonomics. That's where I've uh, they've had those guys on or uh, one of the guys uh, two or three times. But Nudge was really really good. I think it belongs in the pantheon of great. Brain science, uh, economics, uh, literature out there, along with thinking fast and slow and uh, 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 influenced by Robert Cialdini. Uh, I'll Have put it. Nudge right up there. It's really, really good. Excellent. Excellent. Justin? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking for something. You go ahead and uh, you go ahead and go. You got one. Um, my pick. All right. Just push it on to me while I was going to use that time to push <laughs> it back towards. Don't worry. I'm back. It's me, Morgan Freeman. You guys take <laughs> as long as you need. I uh, can fill... my, my pick is the, uh, the new Mystery Science Theater on Netflix. I would say the first few episodes were finding themselves kind of thing, I think. Because I think it's like, you know, you come back in and that was a show that, you know, once that writing got to really on point what all the characters were supposed to be, it really became, you know, great. And, you know, the new guy, uh, he's fine. You know, you got Felicia Day and Pat now Oswald on it and a lot of great cameos in there. And so once it finds, it took a few episodes, I think, for the jokes to really start kind of landing for me. But once they did, they really, really got to be very good. Yeah, Felicia Day, Pat Oswald and Jonah Ray. Uh, Joel Hodgson, you know, pops up in there periodically. And so, you know, and it's one of those shows that like I didn't watch as much during the Mike years. And I thought he was Mike Nelson was was very funny. And then I never even saw like the whole other storyline of where that went and whatnot. But, you know, I've been watching after I finished watching the Netflix version. I went back and watched some of the old episodes and some of that. And there was just such great stuff in there. So many great just. Yeah. And sometimes it might be just four or five jokes in the total, in the total of the hour and a half that really land for you. But that's that's still great. Yeah. Uh, Open Bayou gives the advice that I, 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 I don't know that you have to follow, but uh, I understand the logic. He says to tell people to start on episode two, the Bigfoot movie, which uh, to me was the first time that I realized like, oh, wait, that's part of the brilliance of this is these aren't just garbage movies. They're just good enough that you might watch them as a joke. Uh, because they're so insane, and then with with the extra sauce of all their improv on there, it's it's fantastic. I yeah, I say watch it start just start from the beginning, knowing because otherwise it's it's because the you know, beginning gives you some intros and you get some sort of. But I've talked to people like, oh yeah, I was kind of I, I started. I'm like, yeah, like I think the first few episodes just weren't as solid as the other ones. And I think that some people may have been giving up on there. But I'm like, just you know, watch it and while you have something else going on. And then when it finds itself, I think they do a really good job and I hope they continue on my opinion. Yeah. Uh, my pick is shattered inside Hillary Clinton's doomed campaign by uh, Jonathan Allen and Amy Parnes narrated by Kimberly Farr. I, that's how I listen to it on audible. This is the behind the scenes look at Hillary Clinton's campaign. Uh, the most recent one. Uh, from the very nascent beginnings uh, while she was still in the state house uh, to her, uh, you know, election day and a little bit uh, past that. I did a book review for it on the politics, politics, politics feed last week. So you can go ahead and get my extended thoughts. But if you are into that kind of tell all uh, everybody, especially on losing campaigns, when everybody snipes at everybody else and talks about how it definitely wasn't their fault through anonymous sourcing. Uh, it is great. And it's got a lot of those little tidbitty kind of tidbit things, which I, I love in these books, including the reason why Hillary Clinton initially thought she needed to set up a private email server that dogged her throughout the rest of the campaign. The, the reasoning for it, you could not write better foreshadowing if you were like scripting it out. It's amazing. Wow. Uh, dude, no, I'm in. I'm in. Is it a fast read? How long is it? It's like 10 hours. Uh, oh, yeah. No, in. Going to buy that right now. Awesome. 
Gentlemen, it's been weird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, right. Around the we'll time Morgan break. Freeman appeared, uh, my daughter started yeah, beating on the door. Let me find out what's up. Hey, everybody. Hey. Well, that means I can't go get a coffee. You can go. And I? Uh, yeah, just go. We'll just get it. it it's, it's better we just do it all quick. Do you have a heart out? Uh, yeah, too. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for, for watching live. By the way, if you missed um, if you missed the Tuesday stream, we we got partnered on Twitch. So if you have Amazon Prime, you can actually give us a little bit of free money. Uh, and we're working on a bunch of emotes. We we just I we just hit the number to get uh, ten emotes. So we've already got two right now, and then in the next week or so, I'm going to be working on getting a bunch of new ones in. Um, and if you want to suggest ones, uh, we have the Discord, nightattack.tv slash Discord. Uh, just post post pictures or something in the fan-made channel. Uh, that's a good place to post that stuff. Uh, but yeah, between the things. <laughs> uh, Big Jim, we're going to get emote aren't we? Ah, that's clever. That's Carly. Carly Ray Jep Jepsen should spend like a crazy amount of time getting on Twitch just to have emotion. Wait, e emotions. Ah, ah, we got it. We got it. We got it. Uh, but yeah. So that's that's that. How's the kids? No fires? Uh, yeah, all good. We're all good. Bonnie, uh, Bonnie was in the shower, so she couldn't stop Callie. Ah. <clears throat> Jeez, Bonnie. Man, I don't know. <clears throat> but I get increasingly pleased with the amount of times Brian Brushwood is portray portrayed as a god in Journey Quest. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a weird, like, um, mm -hmm. like... Uh, uh, um, rebound of like you do so many like wild card things <laughs> that you have to be increasingly more powerful to like to just to stay him being alive. In the narrative. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's just destabilizing the story even more. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, still at work. But that's us. why I, I, I like I like the idea that we're like on purpose going to this kind of you know crazy bigger than Earth Wonderland where it's like kind of. That's a good reset moment. It gets us back to being in the desert, trying to get from point A to point B. Yeah. And only the MacGuffin has changed. Although I'm sure, you know, Ashley and, and Andrew await us in the Black Canyon. Uh, oh, this is fun. So, you know that Face app? Um, app? The app called Face app? Uh... So you, you put a photo in and you pick an emoji and it changes the face in the photo based oh, on the emoji. Oh, that's amazing. So this is from Troublemaker in the Diamond Club chat. So he did one forever. So this one's me. There's an Wait, old me. Wait, that's you old. Uh, this is a lady me. This is a girl, okay. yeah. Uh, there's a smiling. They got the teeth. They got the wrong It teeth. almost looks more real. It because... got my. You know what? It got my snaggle tooth. It thought my snaggle tooth oh. was my front teeth. Uh, we got Brian. We got old oh, Brian. Geez. Wow, old that's... Brian looks all right. Yeah. Maybe I should still rock the hair. There's a baby Brian who has bangs. <laughs> <laughs> the lady Brian. I've actually met baby Brian. I've met kids with that hairstyle. <laughs> sure. That's amazing. It's not even really even. Someone needs to go and get their, yeah. their edges. There's, we got Andrew. We got old Andrew. Old Andrew looks all right. Man, uh, that Cheshire cat grin gets Yo, a little more defined. Kid Andrew is like. This, if you told me this child was a YouTuber, like a three million subscriber yeah, yep, YouTuber, yep, I'd be yep, like, yep. Yep. missed my window, guys. Missed my window. <laughs> Lady Andrew does too. Not for nothing. Lady Andrew. Uh, there's just dude. Oh, oh my God! He's become Ian McShane. <laughs> 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 I went out on my Venice Boulevard street. Uh, wow, he did a good job at getting getting rid of that beard for baby Justin, though. And then we have Selena still, Gomez. Like, we have still a, a baby with, you know, a five o'clock shadow, though. <laughs> that is kind of disturbing. That's what I would expect him to start growing <laughs> his beard. What are the, ones, what are the old ones? Uh, uh, dude, look, look at Ian McShane. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> is that amazing? I, it's just me. Welcome to the NSFW show. <laughs> the I think you're about ready to be indoctrinated the into the Country Music Hall of Fame there. <laughs> 
This this does look like a, a lot like Selena Gomez. Lady Justin looks like. Yes, so does Justin, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I'm creeped out because I could see her in the other the girl Andrew dating. You know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know like there are a girl couple Andrew. walking down the street. Oh, no. you You're like, oh, you know. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Troublemaker. Oh, wait, we've got a few Lady, more. Lady Andrew is every press release of, like, uh, a, a Jezebel blogger gets book deal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, Lady Jason Murphy is Tay Allen. Yeah, yeah dude. Yeah, yeah. That's what Troublemaker's that's saying. That's amazing. Lady Jason Murphy is Tay Allen. Baby Jason Murphy has a dark matter beard, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, the algorithm didn't work perfectly on that one. Dark matter beer. Oh my god. Look, old man Jason is the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> I don't always stab hobos, but when I do, I use a ballet song. Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing, amazing. It really is Tay Allen. <laughs> it looks so much like Tay. Uh, okay, I'm going to close these photos of a fish and a goat then. that's all really great stuff troublemaker thank you so much for putting that together thank that you. that might be that might that might have to be a night attack bit if we can figure out a way Such to a make it translate bit yeah but what if our job was to give words to things or maybe maybe what if what if we had the thing and we had to both separately describe it in the most clear way or okay. do like a newlywed thing or something yeah. oh, oh, see if you can bench like like huh yeah I don't know. Okay, there's, 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 there's something there. there we something we can make it to where, like, even if you never see the pictures, it, it plays. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> All righty. Um, How are we doing? Time guys? to jump right into some after things. You guys ready? Ready, ready, yeah. ready. Oh. Give, give me one. Uh, you know what? You guys go ahead. Uh, you guys go ahead. I'm not going to press record or nothing. It's fine. <laughs> no. Just, I mean, you're doing yeah, it for do yourself it, anyway at this point. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, take it away. In three. Welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. And Justin Robert Young. Hey, what's up, guys? So, After Things is the show where we talk about being a creative, about trying to build businesses, trying to succeed, make it in life, just get by, where to bury the bodies in the desert, etc. A couple of guys still trying to figure it out, and we welcome questions from people, and, you know, we'll, we'll... We'll give you our point of view on this, but this ain't like Shark Tank where we really think that we are the end-all be-all and know what the heck we're doing. Um, but we did used to call this segment Weird Tank. So yeah. We'll, we do Weird Tank when people propose business ideas. Uh, then it becomes Weird Tank. And then we will, well, you know, based upon our track record of launching a, 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 a decent small niche podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, first time listener, James Harrison. By first time, I mean first time he's hearing this episode. Uh, James has been with us forever. Yeah, by James the way, for the awesome. record, we were singing your praises, James. I know he's listening right now, but uh, but uh, James, one of the good ones. He's been a fan for a very long time, and, uh, and, and I feel a vested interest in seeing him succeed. So, yeah, one of you guys has got to make it because we, we are out of options for ourselves. <laughs> Look, man, here, so. we fertilized 10,000 eggs for a reason, all right? <laughs> Yeah, we're we're open one of you the next Zuckerberg or whatever or Travis Kalanick. We get a call. We get some stupid paid job for a consulting for some, you know, flash in the pan Internet company. <laughs> their plan. So uh, he writes, here is one for all of you. Have any of you ever had to deal with imposter syndrome? If so, how do you deal with it? Is it something one should concern themselves with or just get your head down and pull through the feelings? If not, what things do you do to stop yourself from having it? So imposter syndrome um is where you kind of feel like you don't belong, kind of like you feel like your people are going to at any moment realize that you're kind of full of it, that you are a pretender, that you just aren't that. And uh, I'm going to say, nope, speaking for Justin and Brian, nope, nope, no imposter syndrome here. Next question, <laughs> moving along. I'm not going to think about that one. Yeah, no. Who, uh, who, who, who asked about that? Was it anybody else? Anybody? Is it you know? I mean, uh, yeah. I just wanted to uh, quash this one down. <laughs> Definitely not it an was... imposter here. Nope. Genuine article. Real McCoy. Right here <laughs> well, for you. you <laughs> yeah. All right, Brian. <laughs> uh, yeah, dude. Uh, I, 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 I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, the answer is yes. Of course, we all, we all suffer it. But, but it's, it's doubly weird. And uh, I, I guess James is in the same group as we are, because very few people have to pick up the phone. And I'm going to use an old metaphor, you know, uh, and design a Yellow Pages ad shouting about how great they are. And so it's like you're, you're, you're faced with this this very real 
moment when, when it's like, am I lying if I don't think I'm that great, but I have to design an ad saying how great I am to buy my show or, or, or visit me or, or come, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I think, I think part of it is is the very nature of of fame and success, right? You know, we inherently uh, can design our our barriers on what we think is famous or valuable or important, and and we believe that they, them, it are other than us, right? It's the reason why we get nervous when we meet our heroes because they're separate from where we are. We live in normal world; they live in in whatever hyperspace super productive dream world uh and when you are trying to get to those spots and try to get to those places and advance your career you know uh you got to kind of model it even if you don't feel that you don't feel the same way about yourself as you do about them and that never goes away well and i think that's the fantasy is you want to believe like wherever someone is they didn't do that in your world they did that in in the the awesome plane of reality that that celebrities you know in asgard basically and it's like that's the weird part is like they still only got 24 hours a day they still only have uh, 200 to 300 uh, people they can name in their tribe think, you know uh think about one of your favorite idols one of the people you look up to okay Right now, one of them is in a meeting or somewhere trying to hold in gas. Yeah. They're like trying to be like, oh, God, if I, I can't, I, I, I should not have had, you know, Chipotle before. This well, is really not good. For, I need to invent an excuse to go to the bathroom. I mean, they're. For me, the weird part is pitching, picturing them uh, switched off. Like, uh, like whatever it is you see them doing, like picture Bill Nye, every time you see him, he's dynamic and excited and wants to, you know, pre like, but, but then there's, there's times that he wants bill time and he's just like, just leave me alone. Just get out of here. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't mean to make up things like I, I know personally, but like you could do this for anybody picture them switched off, just needing some time to regroup. And, uh, that, that alone gives you an interesting introspection. That's kind of interesting. It's been for me has been coming out to LA and you're around a lot of celebrity and then you go to parties and then you hang out with people and then you see that person on TV who plays that cool role and you realize how awkward they are at a party, you know, and you realize that, you know, and when they're not like with people going up to like, you're great. When people aren't doing that, they don't know how to function or have well, and, basic and, conversation. And, and, and it you, really is. We used to, I used to get so much anxiety on scam school about like, I was like, it didn't work. It didn't work. That pause was terrible. Uh, they, they weren't very fooled or whatever. And then I saw the magic that editing could do. And it took a, a long time for me to get to the point where I was relaxed enough to where like, even if something goes sideways, I realized it was more important for me to keep my composure and just trust that the edit would save the day. Um, that, that doesn't exist in real life. In real life, you, you get to own all your flaws and foibles and, uh, like think about all of the action stars and superheroes that benefit very heavily, not only from editing, but also uh, competent direction, si you know, uh, uh, pacing, good story, awesomely written lines and all that stuff. I would imagine. Can you imagine how terrifying imposter syndrome must be to oh. those larger than life characters that they built for themselves and that they're that's known as? why they go through such ego problems and stuff is because they 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 they're constantly and I can think of in magic at least one personality who's just torn apart every relationship he's had with people because he suffers about immensely. And I've, I've had, I've been at parties like friends of Throne that are nice little get together kind of thing. And, and, you know, and I've seen super famous people just standing there waiting for somebody to talk to them because they don't know how to initiate a conversation. And then when you do, you're like, nobody ever even talks to this person. You know, they're just used to like having, you know, talking to assistants or being on a set and all that. And when they're just in a room with a bunch of other people that, are not indifferent, but are like, oh yeah, it's cool you do that thing, but they just can't function, and you realize that like internally, that's a thing people go through. So, uh, well, and and plus also yeah. like, uh, uh, you know, as as hop happens in I'm Hollywood talking about or Brian whatever. Brushwood, guys, I'm talking about Brian Brushwood. Oh, okay, got it. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm Morgan Freeman. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, you hear a lot of stories of celebrities breaking down or being divas or prima donnas or whatever. I would say so many of those stories are people who were inadequately prepped for the situation that they put into, and they didn't expect through some breakdown of communication, either that or insecurity. You know, I heard about some actress who on set just, you know, torpedoed so much stuff through a fit, re insisted on rewrites and all this stuff. And I'm like, those aren't the actions of somebody who feels like they belong there and that this is their space. That, those are the actions of somebody who feels in 
over their head um, and and desperately wants to lash out to those things. And so, you know, when I heard that same story that was clearly meant to uh, spark outrage and fury, all I all I felt was pity for for that person. It's I was about, like, yeah, what a rough situation. Part of the problem that happens in celebrity, too, is that they you everybody who you makes money off of you you know they never want to tell you they're upset or they're angry because if like and if you like if you have agents and stuff and you're doing well your agents constantly afraid that you're going to leave or go elsewhere so if you're acting like a jerk they're just going to make apologies to producers or whatever and you go to these situations where people around you never they never check you like your friends are never there to check you or your friends who are there they're the ones that don't have a lot going on in their life so they can fly out to LA and hang out with you 24 7 and so they become your entourage and sort of dependent upon you in some respects and so you get into this bubble and then when you're on a set and you're dealing with somebody like a director who's a strong personality who has to get things done you'll get these clashes because it's like hey that's great that you have this little bubble where everything you do everything you say is funny and great and everything loves that you do but i need you to do this right now and you can't boss me around or when you can those movies tend to suck because and i can yeah. oh man i can name well, and, and keep in mind that, that people i respect ruined there's a functional aspect to that bubble these are people who are paid like their job is to walk into a room and exude confidence and charisma and feel like like they're 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 just nailing it uh it, whether they are or they aren't they need to feel that way and uh <clears throat> it's kind of like uh i'm terrible at basketball terrible at basketball and before i i ever uh goof off and even practice basketball i'll make sure to like stand directly under the net and sink like seven in a row and then take a half step back and be like oh that's right that's right otherwise i just come in as a as a wobbling mash of of neurosis and it's no good well let me let me let me take this out a a little bit from you know the, the celebrity side to even the more work a day elements that i think we've all sort of uh you know obviously you know joked about the fact that we feel imposter syndrome about because if you break it down, it's not only what you think of other people, but it's what you think of yourself, right? But but it is, to me, 50% on either side. Like, you can be totally right in terms of your self-worth, and you'll still think that these other people that are doing what you want to do or are doing something extraordinarily well that you appreciate and understand to be great are better than you. And And similarly, you can have a great idea that everybody's human and they put their pants on one leg at the time, and be a mess internally, and you're still going to have an imposter syndrome. Like there, there are two steps to mitigating its corrosive effects on your life. One of one of the things to think about too is I remember when I was a kid, my dad made some comment. My dad and my dad's not an arrogant guy in the world. He said that said said hey said you know I I consider myself the best in the world. Like what do you mean? He says well. You know, I, I play basketball better than most of the people in my office. I'm like, okay, but I don't play basketball better than than you know an NBA player. But he says my dad at the time was you know uh, was on like the firearms team, but like I can shoot a fi- I can shoot a gun better than they can. Um, he knows how to hold it too. You know, he says that, and then I could do gymnastics. My dad explained like I've got all the you know he says you have all these different skills that make up who you are, and I'm not going to be better than anybody necessarily in one particular thing, but you add together enough skills, and you're really an accomplished person in your own way. And that's been kind of my life has been about acquiring skills that I may not be the best at, but I might be really good at, and that's I'm going to be enough of it that I will feel confident about it. And then, you know, I think I'm a good writer. I don't think I'm a great writer, but I feel good enough about my writing, and I feel good enough about my magic and good enough about these things that – you know, some people could say you focus, but then I thought about that deeply and I said, you know, what I can do though, when I wanted to get into magic and I said, hey, I wanted to get into illusion design is not a lot of people try to design illusions. It's a very, very small group of people. And I said, you know, I could study it and learn about it and I could be one of the top illusion designers there was. And by the time I was just, you know, still in my early 20s, people were doing my magic performing around the world and I could, I had confidence and I felt less like an imposter because. I had accomplished something. People did it, and it wasn't a crowded niche. It wasn't like, yeah, I, I rose through the uh, the cutthroat ranks of illusion design to become. You know, I'm like, you know, one of, you know, two people who said, hey, I want to become this. I want to do this thing, and if I spend enough time on it, I'll be good at it. If everybody tried to do it, then no, I would not be top ranked. There. Right. Well, and, and that's the benefits of an inefficient market. Uh, that What you're touching on is one of my favorite parts from that Scott Adams book, uh, How to Fail at uh, Nearly Everything and Still Win Big. He talks about how it's better to be good at two things than the best at one thing. And he yep. points out, uh, he says, you know, you could be you could be the best plumber in L.A., but you're going to make less money than a good plumber 
who also is good at speaking Spanish. Like uh, that, 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 that crossroads between two different skills is, is going to be where most of the opportunities lie because that list of plumbers is going to be huge. That list of plumbers who also speak Spanish and also maybe have a clever jingle or whatever is going to be vanishingly small. And now you have an inefficient market that you can afford to to out hustle the other guys and perform. I I we know a we know a guy in magic and I'm not going to single him out here, but I would say he's one of the finest close up magicians in the world. One of the finest. He's amazing. He is. And he's hilarious. And if he's listening to this, he knows exactly who we're talking about. Um and he suffers from imposter syndrome like you wouldn't believe. You know, I've gone to, I've done shows with him, like big lineups and stuff. And he is hands down the best person in the, you know, out of everybody there to performing. He's incredibly talented, but he's got this. But I would say for him, it's like clinical. Is that, is that I could lay out all these examples of like, no, this is why you're good. This is why you're great. You don't need to worry about it. But he just can't. And that's a problem. Like, I don't know if there's any sort of talk therapy can help because this guy just, it's so deep ingrained. It's part of the reason he is one of the best in the world is because he's driven by that imposter syndrome. So he's nonstop practicing. And you just see him do these insanely sick slights that you're like, that's wasted on 99.99% of people. But for him, he does them because he has such a fear that, well, people are going to find out that I'm a phony. And it's like, if you can do that, how could you possibly be a phony? Well, and that's the tough thing is you can't logic it away. This anxiety no. attacks, panic, like you can't logic it away. That's Which is part of the reason I'm so forgiving to celebrities surrounding themselves in bubbles. Like, like you know, even, and, even and yes, you know, by some Brian accounts. Brushwood, guys. What's that? I said, yes, it's Brian Brushwood again. Yeah, yes, again. Oh, oh, another one. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing. It's a logic. I, I think that sometimes you can. I mean, some people can, some people can't. I can logic away certain kinds of anxiety and stuff because I, I always try to have a very rational, what is my metric? How do I measure this? You know, And if that measurement makes sense, then I will move forward on it. And I won't think about it, but that's tricky. Not everybody does that. And, and you know, I think for... For our friend, the, the 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 magician, it's it's hard, you know, because uh, you say, okay, you can't logic it away. That's a complicated thing for me because very often, the worst psychological damage that we can do or I can do to myself is when I'm using very logical progressions, right? You know, hmm. I'm I'm using the uh, you know, what what I'm going to couch to myself as kind of harsh reality into negative or destructive territory. And it's not to say that you're not going to better yourself by being tough on yourself, because very often you are, but there is that line when it stops becoming about working out the muscle and starts becoming about tearing it off the bone. Yeah, but I wonder, I think sometimes it's it depends from where you start, like what what's the, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And I, I go through, Every time I write a book, you go through that anxiety, like, does this book suck? Does this book suck? And I, and I can think of, I can either approach it from one point of like, well, let me obsess about all the flaws on there. Let me obsess about that. And, or I can take it from the point of view and say, uh, well, in objective reality, for some people, the book will suck. For some people, the book will not suck. What are the criteria? And I can sort of, you know, get to that point where I'm like, oh, well, I also have this, I have an editor or I have an agent that will read it first. And if it sucks, she will tell me that it sucks, but... I've got enough track record with her. I can give her a couple suck books and I'll still be fine. You know, and then I can sort of rationalize like, yeah, I should I should submit this. I should click send. I shouldn't keep worrying about this because the cost of not submitting it is greater than the cost of sending it and being eh, we need to rework it. I have enough track record now as a writer that people know I can do good stuff. And that took me building up incrementally. So I can I can and I know like now I'm like, yeah. Generally, my book's been getting better and better reviews, but I know that there's going to be points where I may try to reach a little bit further or I make many mistakes, and that may not happen where I might get books that aren't as well reviewed. I don't want that to happen, but I'm okay with that happening because I know, yeah. rationally speaking, what I can and cannot do. So, so if I hear you correctly, like uh, one of the things is you can't. What I meant when I said you can't, you know, rationalize stuff away, you can't logic it away is in the heat of the moment, you find yourself mm -hmm. trapped and there's no out. But you can logically create a framework that keeps you uh, filled. You could say like, OK, this is the fuel that seem that I seem to run on. This is what I've done before to access that that awesome win state. How do I maximize my opportunity to make that happen? 
Yeah, you know, I, let's take an example. Let's like somebody like James or somebody who's a close-up magician, okay? And, and I was talking about this yesterday with a friend. Performing close-up magic is tremendously anxiety-inducing because most of the gigs that you're doing are you're in environments where you've got to go up to people and say, do you want to see magic? So right out the gate, you deal with rejection. Right out of the gate, as yeah. soon as you step into there, you're going to deal with somebody saying no. Yeah. And as a lot of people, for me, that was always, I would get hired to do events and I'd find out it was like a reunion and people just wanted to talk to each other. And the last thing they want is Magic Boy stepping up in there because my job as a magician is to facilitate and to get people together in a close-up environment was to get people together, to spur conversations and have people do fun things. My job was not to entertain people who are already being entertained and enjoying the conversation, you know, enjoying the com the com enjoying the presence of their friends, right? And sometimes I would get hired by events. I'm like, this coordinator, they they should have had me go do 20 minutes after this or do something like that. But my point is, it's extremely terrifying. And if you're a close-up worker who's working in restaurants or other stuff, every person gets the chance, anybody who's had a bad day has the chance to tell you to screw off and to put all of their anger into you. That being said, is if you're saying, okay, how do I deal with this? You say, okay, well, it's like being a server at a restaurant or anything else. We all have to deal with rejection at some level every single day when we're putting something out there. And you can say, okay, they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting the idea, do they want to be entertained in this moment? That's all it is. And it can be, hey, do you guys like me? It, no, it's like, do you guys want to see something? Do you guys have a moment to see this or whatever? You compartmentalize what you're doing. And then if you need the confidence to do what you do, is you think about like, how many times have I done this before and people loved and they said it was the best thing they've ever seen? And if you're a good magician, not a great magician, but if you're a good magician, you're going to have hundreds of people who have told you it's the most amazing thing they've ever seen because they've never seen magic up close. Right. And well, you just work from there. That's uh, I'm, I'm fond of saying uh, everybody has only seen two magicians, that guy on TV and this guy, the one standing right in front of them at that moment, you know. Yeah, uh, uh, it's also it's fascinating because, you know, I'm I'm 25 years into doing magic. No, 20, 24 years into doing magic now. And I still have epiphanies about how to as gracefully as possible take a random person and guide them into a state where they really want to see magic. That's kind of where the whole philosophy of scam school having openers tweeners and closers in turn. And, and even the stage show was is built to where, like, I don't want to. And again, it's like, what else are you supposed to do? You you walk up and say, hey, would you like to see a magic trick? It's flat. It's honest. It's direct. But it's also hugely ineffective because uh, it doesn't guide people to the right state of mind to take them along the journey. And this is the kind of stuff that is so incredibly specialized. I mean, this matters to maybe 2,000 human beings uh, uh, on a part-time basis across America uh, that they haven't figured out how to you know, master that, that approach on there. I, 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 I don't know. My, my point is, is we all become extremely specialized and I'm sure we all have some part of our life that we're able to say like, Oh, but I've got that. But then it's this other thing that I don't know what I'm doing. And for me, it was realizing how bad I was speaking extemporaneously on the microphone in the early days of scam school and TV uh, appearances before then. It took uh, it took a long time. It took took ten ten years of hammering. Flashback. My head. Um, hey, I'm this uh, Brian, and I'm gonna scam you all right now. <laughs> yeah, would, would you scam? Would you scam, like to be scam, scammed? Scammy school? Hey, scammy school? school? How does scammy right, school sound, Bonnie? Money. Does that think sound about, good? Think about oh, scams. So cool. You want that to happen to you? Because I can make that happen to you. Well, they think this is a scam. That's the problem. This is not a scam. This is not. I'm Brian Brushwood. Yeah. This no, is... I, I certainly wouldn't name the show. Get, scam get ready school. to get ready to go to school. <laughs> Gonna get scammed, scammed, and scam school. Scam school. All right, got it. <laughs> yeah. so. uh, well, let, let me let me just say this about imposter syndrome in general. I think that the worst, like the most damaging that imposter syndrome can be to you is if it stops you from doing a thing. If you think that you right now are so far away from where other people are that it stops you from doing it, that's easily the most damaging. Like there's there's that is unhealthy. You should always want to take a first step into something and be realistic about your goals and your progress. But that's the biggest way that it can get in, in, in and, and, and do real damage to your life. Uh, would you guys agree or disagree? No, sure. I, I chose the things I do, and sometimes it was counter what people around me or close to me told me I could do. 
you know, I had I had a mentor who I really looked up to who told me, you know, I was not going to have a future in magic beyond just doing regular shows. You know, they just told me flat out. No, you're not. It's just not. I've seen it. You're not. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. And I and I had, you know, somebody was somebody looked up to him. A lot of people went to this person for advice and they flat out told me it was never going to happen. It was unrealistic for me to do this. And I had to tell myself and I had a good point of it. I had very low self-confidence, but I had to say kind of my head F you and if it's a matter of the work of doing the work that's going to be the difference, then I'm going to do the work, you know, and and that's I think my results have spoken for themselves is I did pretty well in magic after that period of time, even though I was told by somebody who should have been encouraging that you weren't going to be able to do that. And, you know, and certainly you get imposter syndrome in person, you get, you know, that. But I'm like, I'm like this person, like they don't know. They have not managed their career as well enough as somebody who should know. And you have to make that decision. How badly do you want it? How badly do you want it? And I told myself, I want it bad enough to do the work. I will do the work. I'll do what it takes. Things I need to improve, I'll improve. And when it came close to like when I was getting my TV show, you know, hiring on camera coaching, hiring people like this, even though I was good enough to get a pilot in a series, I said, I'm going to hire people and work with people to do an even better job because I want to sort of elevate that because it doesn't just stop once I get somebody's approval. That's not the judgment for me. It's me saying I got to continuously work on myself and improve that. So you're going to get people who are going to say you can't do it. And you can always have this. You can either with yourself, when it's yourself doubting yourself, you can either say, yeah, all right, I guess I won't. Or you can say, hey, I have a, pro I have a process to improve and get the work done. And that was yeah. Brian Brushwood, by the way, who told me. That. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, yeah, man, it's uh, it's weird. It's uh, you, you sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, imposter syndrome doesn't feel great, but it does – it does provide a very easy off ramp to a mental space of I am forever a beginner, forever a learner, you know, mm -hmm. that um, that nothing I've done means I deserve anything. All that matters is I'm here. I'm at this event. There are 250 executives. They they want to, in general, have a good time. And I have been selected to make that happen. And within those rules, what is the best I could do? Because guess what? The best you could do is all that you can do. It's. It is a very perfect, pervasive, you know, attitude. And I think that it's key to know that it's going on in everybody else's head. And I'm going to give you an example of, uh, are you familiar with the band, the Rock Bottom Remainders? No, I think I've heard I, of them. Uh, yes. So I, as a band goes, they're, I would say that, you know, the, the math department of my high school, the teachers were a better band than the rock band, the, the rock bottom remainders. Right. But the rock bottom remainders, they performed around the country, parts around the world. You know, people love them. They get a fantastic reaction. They're not bad musicians. They're just not really. I, I actually saw a, a signed tour poster of the rock bottom remainders at uh, 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 your friend of mine, Andrew, uh, Anthony Caruso's. Uh, wedding rehearsal dinner was at a a, a bookstore in in Miami that had a signed by the whole band Rock Bottom Remainders poster. So the Rock Bottom Reman the Remainders it's got kind of a floaty membership group but it includes Dave Barry, Stephen King, Amy Tan, Cynthia Hamill, Sam Barry, Scott Turow, and a number of other very famous published writers. I do know about this band. Yes. I remember. Uh, I think it was a. Uh, uh, one of the band members said that Stephen King's worst fear is that they're going to say, take it, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know. They're... And yet somebody was left out. <laughs> <laughs> Still waiting for my call, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Where did half the band go after the middle of the show? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, and we keep waiting for uh, they ask George R. R. Martin to write a song for them. He's going to get back to them on it. Um, it's a it's it's they're not they're not bad. But you go to the music, you'd be like, oh, but what makes it fun is they're like, hey, we're going to go do this thing because we have fans that are going to like anything we do, which is sort of a neat thing. And I, and I use that as an example is that there are, you know, uh, Led Zeppelin, you know what, to my knowledge, uh, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant never written a really good novel mm. never really re and robert plant seems to like lord of the rings but i think he was really high when he read them because he seems to get the plot points messed up in his songs but that's okay um the, the point is is that you know that shouldn't mean that they shouldn't try to do these things that you have people who are very exceptional at one thing that don't have the skills in other places and sometimes you can develop them though sometimes you can accomplish these things but just don't 
don't, don't, don't be a, just, you're just trying to be you. You're trying to be you. If you is always building and improving and getting skills, then that's fine. Cause you're not trying to be somebody else. You're trying to be you. Heck yeah, man. Unless you're Morgan Freeman. <laughs> it was just awesome at everything. All right. Any picks? Any uh, recommendations? Yeah, I got a weird pick. I, uh, I, I, I was playing some Hearthstone and I needed, uh, ran out of my, my Netflix queue and then up pops a uh, Tracy Morgan special. First since his accident, and uh, it was kind of fun to see him getting back in the groove. Uh, it's it. I, I I haven't seen any of his other stand-up specials. I know he's very very funny. Uh, whenever I see him on everything, um, this one you could tell this is this is a ramp up. This is a back to work thing. But but having heard that, it's great to hear him making jokes at his own expense and his uh, his situation. But it's uh, Tracy Morgan's staying alive. Tracy Morgan's stand up has kind of always been little hit or miss. Yeah. He's a personality, and I would dare say an actor, than he is a stand-up. Well, and he also, um, it wasn't like he went and swung for the fences, and it just wasn't the right joke at the right time, or I wasn't in the right mood. It was it was fairly tame, fairly standard, set up punchline, set up punchline. And even the end bit, I'm like, oh, that's it, okay, eh, that's fine. It's good to see you're doing okay, Tracy, yay! You're doing all right! It's glad uh, you're alive. Uh, I have... I have a pick. I can't believe that none of us have, have, have picked it yet. Unless we did, we might have. I finished documentary now, season two. Oh, is oh. is is that out on a streamable platform? Out on Netflix. Oh, damn. Okay. I'm Andrew back and I have spent a lot of time talking about it to each other. Um, is it not good? I, you know, it, it's. It's not, not no 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 it it is good I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I think it's 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 remarkable on some levels. Uh, in fact, sometimes on some of them, the the art the the craft of the episodes are so good that you're just kind of like oh, you're just kind of like doing a different version of the documentary and it looks good and many times it has the emotional beats that are good, uh, but it's not quite there. That being said, there are some, like, just laugh out loud gems. Uh, it, it, it remains one of my favorite shows that are currently on television and, and easily one of the most challenging to do. But, uh, man, Bill Hader and Fred Armisen, like, they are they're remarkable. And, and this, in many ways, is kind of their crowning achievement with, the different ways that they can go comedically and dramatically. Like it's, it's awesome. The, the acting is fantastic and an absolutely fantastic. I would say that like first season for me, the best episodes were when the documentary had its own narrative. It started in one spot. And then the documentary went into a different sort of it. It's like, well, what like, if like this the great gardens, the, case? the very first uh, one where it starts off as Sandy passage. Yeah. yeah. That, that was like that. What made Sandy passage work for me was one, their performances were fantastic, but also that it became a different kind of story, which was made it great. That's what made it so wonderful. Was that same with drones drones was this, and then it became this other kind of, Oh my God, a documentary wouldn't go there. Couldn't be about this. My issue with season two is most of them are just sort of straight up, you know, they're they're It's, hey, imagine if we did this documentary, but with a, you know, a, a version of this person, a different version of this person. And it doesn't go through that twist and it doesn't change the narrative of what happens. And you just watch like, yeah, it's kind of like you just made up everything about the person, but you just followed the template of the documentary yeah, in the beginning, they, the middle, uh, and the end. And I don't feel like I could have just watched the documentary for where it went yeah, other than I, the, I mean, the performances of Hader and Armiston are fantastic. Armiston, they are amazing. So for that, it's great for the, those guys watching them do stuff, but I didn't get this. Oh, cool. It's like my problem with Saturday night live in the last 10 or 15 years is that sketches often have no endings and they go on for two or three minutes longer than they need to. And then they just go to this weird, absurd kind of ending because they don't know how to end it. And they have a funny premise. It's ah, it's a funny premise. And I can't wait to see how it ends. Oh, you don't. It's just premise, 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 premise. Okay. Yeah. With documentary now, it's like, hey, yeah, this is cool. If one of these actors I loved played the part of the subject, but I want to see the documentary have its own story. 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah. a few of them do. A few of them uh, uh, do kind of twist uh, twist things around. Uh, but, yeah. But uh, others. The, the bunker or the what was it the uh, was the bunker that was fantastic. The bunker is 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 one of them, and that's a uh, a, a takeoff of uh, you know, political documentaries, and specifically the one about the Clinton campaign. Um, and then the the other one, the 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 what was it, swimming to Saigon one, something like the yeah, swimming to Cambodia one, yeah, yeah, Cambodia. They have uh, uh, that one also kind of subverts the genre a little bit. Yeah, and then there's others are good like they got the one with uh uh it's it's their takeoff of uh, the kid stays in the picture the the famous um oh what's his name uh Robert Evans yeah there you go Evans doc and it's like you know it's kind of amazing cuz it looks exactly like the kid stays in the picture which has a very distinct visual style but it's really it's just kind of Bill Hader doing the voice and just making up so titles. remember which is funny. It's very, very funny. But, but remember it's... our conversation before we were our conversation um, before I watched that one. I think I got a delay here. Uh, we were talking about documentary now. I said, "Where am I right now?" And I said, "Oh, I'm about to go watch this." And you're like, "Yeah, I can't wait." Or da da da. And I'm like, "Here's my fear." Yeah. And my fear was my fear is it's going to be the kid stays in the picture, but with him and it's not going to they're not going to do the thing, follow their own sort of pathway onto it. And and that's what it was. It was that was my thing. It's like it could be great, but I'm like, I, I'm not holding that out because this season, I don't think they've kind of done what I thought was great about the other one as much, which was subvert the, you know, the the sub the, the genre itself. But anyhow, uh, that being said. Very worth watching, and it, it's not too long to get through. Like they're all what half hour episodes? Uh, I think they're oh, forty. Yeah. Uh, oh, a two parter. Oh, oh, okay. oh, that's right. Sorry, I'm thinking of the Blue Jean Committee one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, uh, everybody should everybody should check it out. It's it's all worth watching. If anything, there are moments where you're like, oh my god, this is the greatest thing ever that people should study. And uh, every once in a while, it's not that, but it's still worth watching. Yeah, cool, gentlemen. It's been after. Wink. Did you did you have a pick, Andrew? No, I was I doubled back. On oh, this. okay, okay, yeah, all right. Thank you for asking. Man, that was a that was a that was a yeah, fun Brian, one, gentlemen. I did, and we didn't get to it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, somebody had to shout. It's been after. Way to go, me. I blame well, Morgan Freeman. For my own actions. Oh man. All righty. Well. All right. I gotta go eat and go do another podcast. Oh, not that you guys know what that's like. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Shit. Hey, oh. everybody. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, thing at 2. Hotline oh, Monday no, at you. 2 o'clock. Um, go ahead and uh, holler at me on Frog Pants. Twitch.tv slash Frog Pants. Oh, wait. So you're only See? you're only a half hour out. You're about to jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mm. normally normally we run right into it. Yeah. Man. Anything we were we were look efficient at, look, today. Look, look 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 at all these shows. All oh, Justin, you notice that Diamond Club has got so many shows. They're all on at the same time, and it's all confusing. And if they all use the same chat about different shows, all yeah right. yeah man. I uh, listen. I'm glad we don't have to deal with that anymore. Every every show has its own chat. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Bye. <laughs>